1. A little background info. I live in a popular tropical tourist destination, and one of my jobs is as crew on a snorkel boat. I set up the boat before the trip, lifeguard, give history about the area, etc. My captain is also the owner of the business, so what he says goes, and knows the local waters like the back of his hand. Our company consists of him, me, and his girlfriend, who manages bookings, phones, and emails. We aren't low quality, but we don't offer full meals or entertainment on board, and focus solely on the snorkel experience. Because of that, compared to the larger boats, our private charters are lower cost than most competition. In turn, we often get penny-pincher people. Onward to the main story. A family of 22 had been hounding our office before they even arrived to our location. Our office's words. They were pushy and trying to get discounts and free upgrades, so I was already dreading this charter. Generally, we take a card number and charge it before the charter, but this group was adamant about paying cash. Office and captain said fine, but told me to get payment before getting them on the boat. Our boat is 50 feet long and stays moored offshore a few hundred yards, so we use a water taxi to ferry from the shore to the boat. I got dropped off to get payment, check the group in, and give them pre-boarding info. I walked up to the main guy paying for everything to start the process, and that's when things went downhill. Hello? Which boat are we going on? I point to our boat, that pretty one right there. That's not the boat we're going on. Yes, it is. There isn't any other boat, sir. No, the boat looks like this, and he shows me a photo of a boat from our website. Yes, sir, that is the same boat. We just had the bottom and paint replaced a month ago. I guess our office hasn't updated our website. Sorry about the confusion, but I assure you, it is the exact same boat. Well, I don't think you're trying to deceive me, but then why would they send me that photo? I'm sorry, I'm not sure what to tell you. It is the same boat. Well, I think we need to go out and inspect it and look at it before we decide to go and pay for it. I'm sorry, sir, that's not how this works. We have already set up the boat for the charter and blocked any other bookings to accommodate your private charter. You can pay and we can take your family out for their excursion or you can decide not to go. We haven't received payment from you, so we have no obligation to you and no money to return. What would you like to do? Then we don't want to go in that boat. Okay, sir, sorry I didn't work out. You and your family have a good day. I picked up my stuff, turned around, got in the water taxi and left them on the shore. As we rode away, I could see the guy already on the phone, trying to call the office. I called his bluff, and he was panicking because his whole family just heard him say they didn't want to go. Even though a lot did. Got back to the boat and explained to Cap what happened. He said it sounds like he doesn't want them on his boat anyway, and their loss. We had planned to refuel after their trip, but decided to do it now since we now had the morning open. They were still on the shore when we left but were gone when we got back. Once back on the shore, the other guys who run activities in the same area told us the group had hung around for about an hour. I guess the guy was very convinced we would come crawling back, but when we didn't, the family started fighting since many had still wanted to go. Now they have to try and find another boat that has 22 spaces open and will most likely cost two or three times more than us. It was totally worth waking up early without pay. 2. Alright, so I'm a 28-year-old female and used to work as a custodian at a fitness center with this dude who is a 43-year-old male, Moby. Moby had beef with pretty much everyone, not just those on the cleaning crew. His main thing was going to complain to supervisors about co-workers, but most of these claims were inflated and exaggerated. At first, I had no idea he would do this at all. Every day, Moby would go out of his way to be friendly to me, strike up conversations, compliment my baking when I'd bring in treats, and was generally a pleasant guy of a bit too friendly. He tended to bring up the subject of dating a lot and how tough it was for him. He was balding, morbidly obese, lived with his mother, didn't have much in the way of money, and I, along with a few others, got the vibe he wasn't too happy to hear I was seeing someone. Still, he never crossed a line, and I thought we were cool. 
After a few months where my shift changed, I came back to work my usual hours with him. Moby had done a complete 180. He essentially gave me the cold shoulder and he seemed to be avoiding me. I figured maybe something happened while I was gone and he was having a rough time, except he was still acting normally with everyone else at our job. I brush it off and go about work. We got a new supervisor. About three months later, I am talking to my other co-worker, Dave. Dave works the exact same shift as us, and we're talking about Moby. I don't like to pry, but his cold shoulder behavior is making it hard to work with him. I ask Dave if something happened while I was away, or if I said something to offend Moby without realizing. Well, as it turns out, Dave tells me that he, a few select co-workers, and most of our higher-ups have heard from Moby that I'm a lazy good-for-nothing that takes two-hour breaks at a time, and he has to do most of the cleaning. He also demanded I be fired multiple times. From the first day our new supervisor had set foot in the center, he had been telling him lies. Dave thought I knew already. Moby was even telling lies to people who come to work out, literally gossiping about me to patrons for months, and basically trying to turn everyone against me and urging them to make complaints themselves. My jaw drops. Not only is none of this true, but I was the one who had to pick up the slack for Moby and was even asked to clean areas he was supposed to because he wasn't doing his job. I found this out later and would have refused if I'd known I was taking on extra responsibilities. The general consensus is they should have fired him years ago. Not long after this, I talked to my supervisor. He says Moby has in fact been talking to him and gave him an ultimatum. Either I go or he does. My supervisor is getting sick of it and flat out says there's no way he would choose Moby over me, and in the few months he's been here, I've basically proven myself to be the best employee there. I mention everything else Dave has told me. Eventually, Moby gets called into a meeting about his conduct and gets written up. To this day, I don't know why he was gunning for me to be fired. Dave thinks he was mad I had gotten engaged and being recognized for my work, but I don't know for sure. I just knew I wasn't satisfied with the outcome. I know I could have let it go and turned the other cheek, but I felt so hurt and betrayed. I wanted to pay him back with more than a little reprimanding from our boss. Following the meeting, I end up taking multiple shifts that week. It's worth mentioning at this point, I'm acquainted with pretty much everyone, and to toot my own horn a bit, they all have a generally positive opinion of me. Custodians, trainers, front desk, even people who work in the pool and building maintenance, etc. And the higher-ups to boot. Or at least appreciate my work ethic. That I'm always willing to lend a hand or an ear and share my baking hobby. I say this because the rest of the week when I chit-chat with my co-workers, I end up bringing up the whole fiasco with Moby. Keep in mind he's already made some enemies, but this is the final straw. Word gets around and most of our co-workers are shocked and appalled. He would go so far to make me out to be a lazy bum and get me fired. By the end of the month, Moby has essentially become a pariah, in part because he's still talking crap about me, but not to the patrons or managers anymore, and no one is having it. I hear about Moby getting shut down, chewed out, and told to shut up on my behalf. So I basically do the exact thing Moby was trying to do to me. Though to be fair, most of it he did to himself anyway. Oh, before I go, I almost forgot to mention, he tried to get back in my good graces. Likely so everyone will stop being mad at him, but I just ice him out too the exact way he did to me. After I left, he did get fired, but it didn't have anything to do with me. I'm guessing enough people had enough of his crap, and they decided to either stop covering for him, or he got someone else angry enough to earn another strike on his conduct. 3. I'm pretty short for a guy, 5 foot 5 or 1.65 meters. At the time of this event, I was in college. We had a class about how we were supposed to deal with aggression, both instrumental aggression and emotional aggression. FYI, emotional aggression is, as the name indicated, aggression coming from emotions like anger or grief. Instrumental aggression is aggression used as a tool to reach a certain goal. It's manipulative and insidious. Most of it was practical exercises where one student had to act as the aggressor and the other as the one handling the aggressor. In this exercise, I had to pretend to be the aggressor 
while the other student, Aggie, had to be the victim while trying to get me to leave the premises. There are certain tactics for this, like starting out polite and getting increasingly less polite, until eventually the victim keeps yelling, Get out! Which is usually where the aggressor stops and actually gets out. Aggie was taller than me by at least 20 centimeters, about 7 inches. While we were doing the exercise, he laughed and mocked me, saying, Sorry, but he could never be intimidated by such a small guy like me. I was trying pretty hard to come over as aggressive, but all he did was laugh. It felt pretty humiliating, just do the exercise please, even if you have to play along. A couple of months later, we have to do our exam, and I get paired up with the same guy. Again, I am the aggressor, using instrumental aggression. The situation is that I'm smoking in a non-smoking area, whereas he is a safety advisor trying to get me to leave. Oh boy, it's payback time. In a normal situation, I have to act up a bit and then leave after tactics are used, but I felt like simulating real life just a tiny bit more. This is how the exam went while other students and the teacher watched. Excuse me, sir, but you're not allowed to smoke in this parking lot. Please put out the cigarette. Nah. Again, it's against the rules to smoke here. I advise you to leave. Advise all you like, boy. I'm telling you to leave now. I yawn and pretend to ignore him while smoking a fictitious cigarette. Get out. I chuckle and keep smoking. Get out. This is where the scenario usually ends. I start walking towards him and blow fictitious smoke in his face and see him get flustered. Get out! I walk back towards my smoking spot and continue smoking. Just because you're yelling now doesn't mean anything's changed. His face is beat red by now, and he's visibly shaking from nervousness. It's still an exam after all, and he's at a loss. If you don't leave, I'm going to call the police. Cools an ice cube, I say, go ahead. A few more puffs and my cig is finished anyway. He pretends to call the police. Well, I'm done. See you, dumbass. Scenario end. Visible relief on his face and that of the surrounding students, who thought it was all a bit too intense. A walks up to me, complaining that I dragged it out too long. Responded by telling him, things don't always play out the way you've learned them in class. Teacher agreed with what I said and follows up by saying that the important thing was that I left, even if his actions didn't have that much impact on me. He still did everything by the book, so it's not like he failed his exam, which wasn't my intention either. I just wanted to give him a hard time because shorties are people too, jackass. 4. The enigmatic thief known as the Coffee Thief makes a bold return to the office scene. Brace yourselves for a tale of intrigue, caffeine, and a brewing battle that's sure to keep you on the edge of your seats. Just when we thought peace had been restored and the stolen coffee mystery laid to rest, the unmistakable signs of a coffee thief began to re-emerge. Mugs once again went missing, leaving behind puzzled co-workers and a lingering sense of déjà vu. Yes, my friends, the coffee thief was back, and this time... They were determined to reclaim their caffeine crown. Whispers filled the office corridors as co-workers traded suspicions and theories about the identity of this relentless culprit. Someone blamed the late-night janitor, while others pointed fingers at the perpetually jittery co-worker with an insatiable caffeine craving. The coffee thief's true identity remained elusive, shrouded in a cloud of beans in secrecy. But fear not, for our hero, the coffee-loving champion of justice, was not one to shy away from a challenge. Armed with a mischievous spirit and a burning desire to put an end to this thieving madness, they hatched a plan to outwit the coffee thief once and for all. This time, our hero decided to take a different approach. Instead of resorting to pepper-infused concoctions, they turned their attention to the art of misdirection. They discreetly filled a decoy coffee pot with a special blend of decaf coffee, cunningly disguised to look and smell like the real deal. Little did the coffee thief know that their reign of bean banditry was about to meet an unexpected twist. Days turned into weeks, 
and the office buzzed with anticipation, waiting for the coffee thief to strike again. And sure enough, one fateful morning, the trap was sprung. The coffee thief, unable to resist the irresistible aroma of their coveted prize, made their move, swiftly pouring a generous cup from the decoy pot. But instead of the familiar jolt of caffeine, the coffee thief was met with a surprisingly mellow experience, as the decaf blend revealed its true colors. Confusion washed over their face, and they soon realized they had fallen into our hero's brilliantly laid trap. Laughter echoed through the office as the coffee thief, now caught in the act, found themselves at the center of a prank they hadn't anticipated. The stolen coffee caper had been foiled, leaving the coffee thief with a taste of their own deception. While the identity of the coffee thief remained a mystery, the reign of coffee-related mischief was finally brought to an end. The office celebrated this victory, reveling in the triumph of camaraderie and a newfound appreciation for their beloved brew. So, dear listeners, let this tale remind us that sometimes even the most persistent adversaries can be outwitted with a dash of creativity and a sprinkle of humor. As long as coffee lovers stand united, no coffee thief, no matter how elusive, can dampen our spirits or steal our joy. Stay vigilant, my friends, for the coffee thief's legacy might linger, but our collective determination to protect our caffeinated heaven will always prevail. Until next time, keep brewing, keep laughing, and may your coffee always be untainted by the sticky fingers of a mischievous thief. Cheers. 5. I work at a department store in a plaza off the main road into town, and getting out at rush hour is a nightmare. A lot of side roads and the interstate converge right next to the majority of businesses in town. This day was exceptionally backed up since an 18-wheeler flipped on the interstate. With the added traffic hitting town, there's always the crowd who are convinced some crappy back road will cut an hour off their commute. At the end of this back road of choice here, it's a right turn at a four-way stoplight to keep going into town. So everyone on it decided right on red. Actually means unless someone that has the green light T-bones us, we always have the right of way. Eventually I made it up to second at the light. At this point I had been on this eight mile stretch of road for 45 minutes with the same two older guys in Stubaroos both in front and behind me. But halfway through our third green light of being cut off by the right on red crowd, old boy in front of me just plows through. The guy behind me actually starts enthusiastically clapping. Immediately, I love his energy. It's traffic, so there's no going far. But guy in front of me makes it through the intersection. Once he finally cuts off the right-on-right crowd, I start creeping in. There's not enough room for the Subaru behind me, so he stops a little ahead of the stop bar to let people turning in and out of businesses through. Class act. So I'm just rolling up to the Subaru in front, and some guys turning out of the side road take major issue with me. They start waving around, screaming at me to move so they can squeeze in. They have a small car, but there's clearly no room. They just want to get through enough to cut off the guy behind me. Up until this point, I've just been happy to be sitting down and listening to my own music after an 8-hour retail shift. But again, I just got done with an 8-hour retail shift, so I have some entitlement. The audacity of these men to lean out of their car and scream at me so they can cut off this guy who was already letting people through broke something in me. Of course, they had tried to intimidate the guy in front of me too and were already pulled up as much as possible, which made them boxed in by the people behind them, who were actually at the stop bar. So with my ears ringing with rage so loud I could barely hear them screaming, I pulled up so my back tire was just in front of their bumper, basically making it so they can't move without hitting me. Sitting in my little shitbox wearing my pathetic retail uniform, I looked the driver dead in the eyes, turned up my stupid dad rock to drown out their screams since all of us had our windows down, and put my car in park right as their light turns green. can see the guy behind me is clapping again. To make it better, their entire green light cycle, the traffic didn't move. Right as their light changed to red, somebody turned off and made just enough space for me to move forward 
and let the Subaru behind me through. Of course, I waved the clapping guy up so he could continue the cycle of cutting this jackass off. And he caught on instantly and was visibly laughing. The last I saw as the light in front of me cleared was the entitled duo getting stuck in the same situation by the next person. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream. Yes, we're back to that. Episode 270. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. If you'd like to support the channel and get the videos a bit early, you can support me through my Patreon, which is linked near the top of the description. Just click Show More, uh, or go to Patreon and search for Hellfreezer. I'm putting all the videos up there as they're uploaded. It's generally, they're uploaded about Tuesday all seven videos at once, so they'll be available for Patreon supporters. The reason I'm doing that is I figure I can at least make the videos available to my Patreon supporters while YouTube's doing whatever YouTube is doing right now, and when I'm able to sh to uh, publish them, I will be able to publish them on YouTube when they're cleared to be published. And I think that's going to work best going forward. I will try to get a little bit further ahead in the week, but for now, it'll just be the week's videos up early. And you can also support the channel through buying Hellfreezer merchandise, and you can leave super thanks and super chats on videos and streams. It's not required to keep enjoying the channel, but it is very much appreciated, and it helps pay a few bills. And food, which is always good. Alright, with that being done, let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... Right, now and again, I might be the only one that does this, but there's a certain food stuff... I'll have a lot of it because I've not had it for ages. Or it's something slightly new I've discovered. Uh, so what are yours? Some some sort of new food stuff you've kind of, you're enjoying, you're binging right now, you're using a lot of it, a particular ingredient. Or something new you've discovered. Right now for me, uh, I like cucumber, I very much enjoy cucumber, but I don't buy it often enough. Uh, but lately I've been buying these little little mini cucumbers and slicing them up and putting them on sandwiches. And they're so good, especially if you toast the sandwich. And the one, one I had last night, uh, this was inspired by my partner Jack, is it's cream cheese on one slice, then it's like the tuna and sweet corn like sandwich filler on the other slice of bread. Then you've got your your, your little, little cucumbers on the, on the middle, you've toasted the bread, and then slap that on and then cut them in. Oh, it's just so good. So that's my thing right now, and I've only got one tiny cucumber left, so I might have to go out either today or tomorrow to get more. So why don't you let me know in a comment below what some of your favourite uh, food indulgences are right now. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.